It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest, episode 244, at block height 657,072, on November 15th. What's up, Janine? Well, we had a Friday the 13th a few days ago. Yeah, I'm really disappointed that weird things didn't happen, because it's like, what the hell? It's Friday the 13th, 2020. Weird shit should have happened. Why is it February 15th? What? Why is it February 15th? It said Friday. What? I don't know. I... Hold on. You said it's February 15th. Nope. Okay, <laughs> there is absolutely no proof of that. Um, nobody outside of this room is going to hear this recording unedited. So um, that didn't happen. <laughs> okay, then. I'll just say it randomly during the episode. So I'll make it harder for you to remove it. No, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just edit over saying that, but then nothing else. So it's even weirder. All righty. Oh, boy. I thought I was missing some kind of inside joke for a second. No, my brain is fully functional. Um, there is no hangover involved. 100% um, peak efficiency. I see. Oh, great. They can hear me. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to... I'm going to shift a hard gear here. We're going to go into Lots the first story. Lots of in the intro. <laughs> The the the, uh, the comedy routine has ended. So uh, everybody has been talking about this all week because um, this this is one of those irritating cases of we finish recording the last show and then immediately after um, something is released. But uh, yeah, the DMG uh, mining pool. So. Uh, this this is something I have been shrieking into the wind about for probably a year or two. And in the last couple months, I actually gave a talk related to this topic um, at the PlubSec Security Congress. And, you know, it's finally here. Um, for the past five, ten years, um, regulators have been entirely focused on marketplaces and exchanges as far as lassoing things with regulations and um you know now that's starting to happen with mining um but it, it's really fucked up because it's not just the government knocking on the door and going you have to do this um that knock hasn't occurred yet this company is just choosing to do this and they are pretty much systematically um looking at all of the different aspects of this related to the individual miners and just users of the blockchain in pretty much all the exact ways um, I've been saying this would happen. Um, they require miners mining with that pool to KYC with them. So if you want to mine at this uh, this Bloxier pool, you, you want to help, um, you know, cuck everybody um, to bullshit like this, um, you have to dox yourself. There is now a record kept of every terahash that you direct at that mining pool, of every penny mm. that you get paid out from that mining pool, all there. So they are now with this pool, and if if other pools start um, 
you know, adopting these types of procedures or new ones come up doing the same kinds of things, um, they are now going to be IDing all of the miners. And it's, it's not like that wasn't already possible if you dig around and search through records, but it's just putting it all in the nice convenient place. And on top of that, um, DMG also has um, their Blockseer chainalysis platform. Um, and they're going to be applying that to every transaction put into a block by the mining pool. Um, and they're not just going to be blacklisting um, anything sanctioned by OFAC, which is what's in all of the headlines. They're also going to be applying um, their own risk score for all transactions not just sanctioned ones um, and anything that hits a high enough risk threshold for their um, you know um, procedures for that is not going to be mined by the pool so this is creating comprehensive financial records for every miner which will be reported most likely by Blockseer, um, rather than leaving that as an issue for individual operators um, they're collecting all the kyc data for everybody operating hardware with them and they are going to start playing the game of censoring bad transactions and yeah um i think there is going to be a hell of a lot more of this um the past year or so we've seen major hash rate migrations from china to you know, Europe in the West, um, you know, North America in the West. And I think that the more that that migration starts occurring, um, the more this type of shit is going to happen. And it's really only a matter of time in my mind, now that you have this company preemptively complying with things that they were not asked to comply with, um, before the government starts explicitly making these demands. Um, they're not going to see this and then go, oh, I hope everybody does this. They're going to see this and go, hmm, maybe we should require everybody do this. So, yeah, this is a real systemic problem at this point. And there's really no way to gauge the scale of the, the threat this presents to the Bitcoin network without just watching this happen seeing or just just sit back and see how many of these pools pop up how much hash rate mines at these pools and really just see how that settles because right now just looking at this one pool th this isn't really enough to gauge whether this is something that will catch on in the entire mining ecosystem or if it's just going to be some niche things that overly cautious morons do but yeah that shift is going to happen and we're going to have to sit back and watch how far it goes. And if it goes too far, um, start thinking about how to deal with this. I did not look into the story at all, but like over the past few days, I've just seen random people that I'm following, like sending angry messages to one tweet by this, uh, company and i was just like wow everyone is very pissed off i wonder what they've done <laughs> oh yeah i i hope that keeps happening i hope that their twitter account gets dogpiled and their bullshit called out every instance they try to sell it but yeah th this is gonna happen and like you know really the best case situation that you can do or, or create is bring these issues down to the level of individual hardware operators like decentralized mining pools actually turn them into non-custodial protocols instead of services running on these protocols that custody and handle the actual financial side of things um but even at that point they can still go after individual hardware operators so it's it's really even the most um, flexible solution that could be done to deal with this on a technical level. All it does is all it does is move the point of risk from these big central pools down to the individual hardware operators. It doesn't remove the risk. 
it just shifts it to what hopefully is a much more geographically and jurisdictionally distributed group of people. And really, that's that's the best that can be done to deal with this problem. Yet beyond that, it's just a game of incentives. And how do those incentives play out and reach an equilibrium? KYC, no thanks, re. I concur. But I guess reading aside, uh, I want to take us along into the next one, which um, actually does have a somewhat loose connection to this uh, DMG issue. Oh, I was uh, not aware of that connection, um, but maybe you can explain it. Uh, basically, on November 11th, uh, the Bitcoin network had a small chain split at block height 656477, and it was mined by F2 pool and only went to a length of two blocks. Uh, the alternative, which was mined by BTC.com, apparently ended up being the successful chain. Uh, and yeah. It's a rare event for us to get a two block chain split. Um, normally just get one orphan block, so it's a rare event, but as you can all see, nothing really of consequence came out of that. But what's the connection to the DMG? Well, I have been um, talking to a few people in private the past couple days because um, I have noticed recently a lot of stale blocks um, that almost never used to happen. Um, let alone the, the the example of two in a row um, right here. But apparently, for a couple months now, um, the fiber network has been shut down. Um, the the backbone relay network between miners to give them the the best propagation speeds possible so that you don't have um these stale or orphan blocks um and that pretty tightly correlates with the the frequency of orphan blocks going up and that that's just nobody noticed that like nobody announced that publicly matt didn't say anything that i saw um and from my understanding a lot of miners haven't even noticed that it's gone offline. But that really does on the margin affect the profitability of things. And it's it's gonna create a little nudge pressure towards bigger centralized pools to deal with that. And that that's kind of opening the door of making it a little easier to regulate pools the way that uh, DMG is trying to get ahead of things and go, look, we're regulating ourselves for you. Like that, that really puts the mining layer of things back a little bit. Yeah. And it, it's just, it, it is really frustrating to me, you know, that nobody wants to, to look at these things to take potential threats around these issues seriously um the incentives will magically work out um no like solving problems like this distributing the mining ecosystem more giving tools to remove custody remove trust remove central points of coordination is every bit as important if not more so for the long-term health and scalability of this network than things like Lightning Network. But everybody loves to focus on things like Lightning Network and ignore the foundation it's built on, which is this entire mining layer of the system. And it's it's just like, it's it's completely neglected in terms of thinking about things, analyzing threats, considering solutions to threats. It's like everybody has just thrown their hands up and, and just gone, well, it'll play out how it plays out. Like, you, you know, like how, how do you have such a critical piece of infrastructure like that? You just gets turned off and nobody gets told. Most people don't even notice. I mean, like, that's not a good ask sign. Why he turned it off. Um, I would, but he blocked me on Twitter for saying that there is another side to somebody calling 
another developer names. So he just instant blocked me. Um, so I can't, but you know, anyone else out there, um, who isn't blocked, you should ask him. Shinobi, is that true? Did he just block you after you said that? Or did you get angry and do your thing? No, I quite literally, like he was yelling about Mr. Hoddle insulting Mark Friedenbach. And all I did was say, Matt, there is a little bit more to that story than that. Block. Oh, well. Can I ask him from the Block Digest account? Yeah, sure. Why not? Live tweeting, everyone. Yeah, it's like, you know, things like lightning are going through, um, like smart contracts are going through a massive renaissance right now. Like we need that ki- that type of development to occur at the mining layer too, because there are just as many problems and issues that need to be solved. And it's just doesn't capture interest. Well, there's some good news on the trading front. Or should I say lending? Yeah, why don't you take us into that? So towards the end of October, as you all have probably already heard, Hoddle Hoddle, which is the Baltic-based non-custodial exchange, uh, announced the launch of a new Bitcoin-backed peer-to-peer lending platform. Uh, and CEO Max... Kuden had reported um, shortly after that launch that within 24 hours, they had already seen half a million in liquidity. I don't know if he means dollar value or euro value, but half a million in some fiat currency or maybe Bitcoin. Well, I guess it would be Bitcoin because the whole point of it is that they don't have fiat currency. So I'm assuming half a million dollars worth of Bitcoin. But anyway, currency not specified on uh, November 13th. Uh, Just two days ago, they announced that um, this platform is now open for U.S. customers. Uh, In their announcement post, they say, From now on, any user can globally earn interest by becoming a lender or receive some liquidity by borrowing state coins. We are removing borders uh, to make this product truly global and to bring value to the Bitcoiners around the world. As you know, HODL HODL has not served the U.S. market up until this moment. However, we have always wanted to enter the U.S. market, so our new Bitcoin DeFi project has become the latest tool to start since being non custodial eliminating fiat has helped us remove the barriers to entry. But HODL HODL is the first of our products entering the U.S. and we aim to bring more products to the U.S. market, allowing American users to benefit from the truly peer-to-peer services of HODL HODL. Removing fiat also removes the currency barriers, meaning that you being a leader from being a lender from the U.S. can lend to a person from Russia. <laughs> Great, uh, great example there. That's exactly the kind of thing <laughs> that we need in the marketing of this and vice versa and for anywhere in the world. So create your offers and let Bitcoin erase boundaries. Um, of course, given that both HODL, HODL, the exchange and this lending platform don't do KYC, of course, whether you're an American is largely relevant unless, you know, I mean, they might. I, I've never looked into whether they've actually banned someone that they suspect of being American, but obviously if they're not KYCing people, you could just be a uh, American in meat space only and be a cyberspace something else and use either of these and they probably wouldn't be able to tell in a lot of instances, but now they are officially welcoming in the Star Spangled banner peeps of the Bitcoin space. Golf clap. I mean, like, you know, honestly, like, I really am starting to think at this point that as far as pushes to use Bitcoin in any kind of retail sense, um, I really am starting to think that crypto backed loans like this are really going to eat alive a lot of the transactional layers and systems people are are making right now just to handle um you know direct bitcoin payments where you're just custodying that and sending that off like it's just so many reasons it, especially like the the tax consideration of that um like 
you know, people aren't going to want to deal with the headache in jurisdictions that tax it like this, where you are paying capital gains on every stupid little purchase you want. But if you can just zap Bitcoin into a contract like this and receive a loan and then not have to do any tax accounting or nightmare headaches until you actually close that loan, all of those problems are solved. Mm -hmm. In this case, it is a true HODL HODL project uh, because with the exchange, obviously that's trading. You're not really HODLing, so the name was a bit um, not perfect fit, but in this case, it actually makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm just glad that they finally have something on offer for U.S. customers because it is... It is time that, that somebody starts trying to push that, why do we have to collect um, information if this is how the platform works in this country? Because most of that stuff has just been burned out. And, and there, there is nothing except the handful of ATMs that you can still use burner numbers on or go dox yourself to somebody. Like There's no real on or off ramps anymore without... Like, th that's your, your selection. Step aside, BlockFi. How about step off the cliff? I like that more. Yeah, specifically roll off the cliff and fall into the uh, water below as, you, as Palantir uh, did in the Two Towers. You know, because that's where your security person came from. Well, see, my brain, the instant you specified water, it, it deviated right away from any kind of Lord of the Rings reference to the crazy witch doctor dude falling down the cliff in the second Indiana Jones. That too. Speaking of which, Blantyr is on kind of a marketing campaign recently to uh, dispel misunderstandings about what they do and apparently they're not a data company they would like us to know that they've published a long blog post about what they do and don't do what? and they're they're not a day i mean i can go read it it's quite funny but they say that they're not a data company that is a lie it's well, just a lie maybe maybe we should read their lies i will go find it all right, I think there is an impromptu um, in the moment addition to the stories today. Excuse me while I open it in Tor browser. <laughs> All right, so the post begins. Palantir is often described as a secretive company. There is some truth to this. <laughs> For many years, we primarily served institutions with exceptional confidentiality expectations in fields like defense and intelligence. We often had little choice but to remain silent about our work, even when misunderstandings about the nature of our business appeared in the media or in the public sphere. Now that we serve clients in a wide range of sectors, we have an opportunity to be more open. This is particularly true for sectors like healthcare, where Palantir software is used to process personal data. People have a right to understand how Plantier technology works and how our customers use it. Common misconceptions recur, particularly around the assumption that Plantier can use or transfer client data for its own purposes or can join data from different clients together to sell on. This is not how we operate and never has been. <laughs> I just zoned out after the, the phrase intelligence because isn't the entire your intelligence industry like don't they just manage and analyze data? Like, is, isn't, isn't that what that is? Data? Yeah, so Palantir is basically saying we don't handle the data, we just help the data people handle data. <laughs> basically. So they're not a data company, they're a data consulting company. That, that's, still, that's still a data company. The, the rest of the post says, Palantir is not a data broker or data aggregator. Unlike many tech companies, our business model is not based on the monetization of personal data. We do not collect, store, or sell personal data. We don't use personal data to train proprietary AI or machine learning models to sell to, to 
share or resell to other customers. We never facilitate the movement of data between clients, except where those clients, specific clients have entered into an agreement with each other. Palantir is a software company. We build digital infrastructure for data-driven operations and, <laughs> and decision-making. Our products serve as the connective tissue between an organization's data, its analytics capabilities, and operational execution. Palantir's platforms tie these together by bringing the right data to the people who need it. <laughs> data <laughs> again. The... <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Uh, Palantir's forms tie these together by bringing the right data to the They're people who need it. They're not a data broker, but they broker data to people. It, My it brain's going imploding. Up. Allowing them to take data-driven decisions, <laughs> conduct sophisticated analytics, and refine operations through feedback. We license the software to organizations who receive secure and unique instances of our platforms in which to conduct own work on their own data. <laughs> I, like, it's like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> There's more. Our software platforms allow organizations to better manage the data that they already lawfully control. Keyword there, lawfully control, <laughs> of course. <laughs> These platforms are used in some of the most sensitive and secure information environments in the world, necessitating world-class data protection and governance. As such, we have a, an exceptionally strong information security record. With regards to customer data, we act as a data processor, not as a data controller. Our software and services are used under direction from the organizations that license our products. These organizations define what can and cannot be done with their data. They control the Palantir accounts in which analysis is conducted, and any Palantir engineers that assist them in their work follow these directions. We do not and cannot reuse or transfer our clients' data for our own purposes. Attempting to profit from customer data in this way would be illegal and would undermine the trust that is necessary to work in the sensitive environments in which we have built our business. That's really funny because like one of the most popular uh, articles about them is how one of the so-called Palantir engineers, uh, I believe it was JP Morgan Chase or something, uh, they were like spying on the employees and even the executives and uh, trying to like, <laughs> like they would basically analyze their work patterns to the point where if someone like, I don't know, came in unusually late or something or there was just something off about their behavior that they would get flagged as a potential whistleblower like i don't know <laughs> uh, I, eh, there, there's a line there i suppose um i'm just trying to reconcile this isn't peter Thiel supposed to be like a libertarian why is this company talking like a bunch of post-modernist marxists that that are acting like reality is whatever their arbitrary description of it is. Because um, none of those words actually map to reality. I do not know. <laughs> like, you literally broke my brain. Like, my brain is empty. Like, I can't come up with anything articulate to call bullshit because of the enormous size of the pile of bullshit it's it's kind of like uh when people say like cloud computing or it's in the cloud and like the cloud sparkle 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 but it's like no the cloud is just other people's computers and i feel like they were talking that way about data <laughs> yep i think that is a perfect succinct description there because like their claim that like oh we don't put data into our algorithms and it's like um okay how exactly do they work then like because on some level well you see we put the algorithms into the data <laughs> i mean on, on some level like i mean when you're using those kinds of tools if you're not actually using real data that corresponds like i mean they're deploying palantir deploys stuff that are, are is being used in war zones and has been used in war zones like they bragged about like they've helped the u.s government kill terrorists and stuff like that in their uh 
their very long uh we're leaving silicon valley cry fest post um i think it was to the sec or something and so if you're not using real data are you saying that you're like how how can they train these systems to do any kind of analysis without putting in real data are they like killing it's kind of like reminds me of when michael hayden said we kill people based on metadata but we're definitely not you know spying on americans it's like but how do you decide who to kill if you're not putting in real data somewhere like clearly this is a lie like (laughs) this is all a lie (laughs) there's real data going in somewhere we're just not being told about it post truth that is where we live now it's in the cloud speaking of the cloud and data gathered through it though i do believe a company that i don't like that much did something smart yeah, so uh, on November 11th in the latest releases, I say releases because they did a hot fix um, the day after that is slightly more recent than the release they did most of these changes, is that in their new desktop uh, application, Trezor has not only enabled Onion Location, which is, um, if you don't know what that is, if you're using the Tor browser and you go to a website that has an Onion service version available, then the a little um, kind of sticker will pop up in the address bar to tell you, oh, there's an Onion service version available. And that, that pops up if the website you're going to uh, has enabled Onion Location, which basically tells Uh, It's like a marker that um, tells you on the not Tor-based version of the website that there is a Tor version available. Um, So they've enabled that, and they've also integrated a a Tor switch feature, which will, uh, as they say, make it a little easier for users to quickly and effectively bring greater anonymity and peace of mind by masking your network activity. Um, Obviously... uh, yeah, well, I'll get to that later. But yeah, so Trevor, uh, yeah, Trezor services. Um, I actually don't. I'm not sure if this was part of the update because I didn't see like a, I didn't see a timestamp for when they last edited this. But in the Trezor wiki, um, it's now also possible to use Trezor, um, the the suite or the web app through the Tor browser, and you can do that with their Onion service. So that's pretty cool. You can find instructions for that in their wiki. Um, And then just from their announcement post, they say, start using Tor with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies by upgrading to the latest public data version of Trezor Suite, which is their desktop app, Um, now available to download from the Twizzer, eh, Twizzer, (laughs) oh my god, it sounded like bug funny, Trezor Suite landing page or directly from the desktop app. You can find a list of changes when you start the app or in the Trezor Suite GitHub release notes. If you only use the Trezor Suite web app, you do not need to do anything to start using the new features. The Tor Switch is only available in the desktop app. And so just to clarify, um, for anyone who is not that familiar with Tor, what it does when you use it, uh, using Tor would protect you against network observer who would attempt to link off-chain data points such as your IP address or expanded from that the geographic location uh, of where you are where you're connecting to the internet with on-chain data Um, unless you're using your own node obviously Trezor services will still see your address balances and this is actually um, one of the things that is recommended when you use uh, blockchain explorers through Tor is that you should not be um, when you're putting in addresses to blockchain explorers you should actually be uh, probably refreshing your identity uh, with each address that you're looking up because otherwise technically whoever is running the blockchain explorer service could uh, they won't know your IP address but they will be able to say okay this person who was uh, using our block explorer through Tor put in these addresses so these addresses are probably owned by the same person Um, or they can make some kind of assumption like that that they are addresses that are known to one person. Um, and so that would also be relevant here. I don't know what kind of functionality they give with that. I think they mentioned in the post um, somewhere, I think maybe it was on the wiki page, they talked about um, 
make like refreshing it so that uh maybe when you do a transaction or something you can refresh the identity i'm not sure there was probably more information on the wiki but yeah uh by default trezor's services will probably still know your address balances and that you know the addresses that you have uh active are kind of correlate together so this would not fix you know bad coin management practices it wouldn't hide your transactions or obscure your transaction history on the blockchain in any way all it does is not dox your ip address to trezor and make it harder for people observing um the network to figure out which addresses are yours or to figure out that they're all correlated together and yay, they finally did something that every hardware wallet maker with a companion app like this should have done from day one. Yay! Yeah, I'm... I mean, that's part of the reason that I don't use those kinds of apps very much, because um, a lot of them don't even function over Tor. Like, some... Uh, it, whatever, you know, if they're not custom built to work with it or anything that's not unexpected but like a lot of them don't even work with tor like kiki oh god that garbage wouldn't even like i didn't even use it for anything i just wanted to see what it looked like and it kept like pestering me to use shapeshift and it wouldn't even it wouldn't even update like the 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 update uh got stuck and just wouldn't do anything so keep keys a piece of garbage uh that probably doesn't work over tor i'd be surprised if it does um but yeah more uh more wallets should be uh helping their users to be able to use tor if if not uh explicitly then at least making it easy to use over tor Yep. Next step, stop sending XPubs, use neutrino filters. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's not practical in a web app, but anybody who downloads that standalone desktop app, why isn't that just getting neutrino filters and requesting blocks so that even Trezor isn't correlating your coins anymore? Like, why aren't you doing that? Re. So what are the shit coiners up to now? Oh my god, this is so funny. So um I don't remember exactly which fork this was cuz I honestly didn't care to spend a few seconds looking it up. Um but one of the previous uh BSV forks um ripped out pay to script hash which is what multisig was done with because re this is not satoshi's true original op code and then they went and replaced it with some new idiotic thing that is also not satoshi's true original op code um they pretty much constructed a script that works just like pay to uh public key hash except it kind of cycles um replacing the keys and checking signatures and then does a check against how many have passed now the fun part here is when it does that that check comparison um the logic in that is completely broken um and so like how an op code like this should work is let's say you have a three of five multi-sig um all right, so when when the threshold comparison is checked, um, how it should work in a three of five is that three or more signatures, although there's no sane reason to add a fourth or a fifth, um, are a valid transaction. And anything below the three is invalid. So they screwed up the operator logic in this so that um, in their instance, um, anything above the threshold, which although nobody would want to pay more fees, should be valid, was invalid. And anything below the threshold was valid. 
So literally every multi-sig address <laughs> generated with this scheme could be spent with zero signatures. None. Cool. And yeah, that's that's been happening and being exploited for the past couple of days. And I I honestly love the fact that Greg Maxwell pays attention to this shit and calls it out and goes through all the analysis of it because honestly, if he didn't, I would not be willing to put in the time to research this shit to get the good laughs that I get regularly. So I would just love to applaud Greg Maxwell for, you know, shuffling through the trenches like that because the rest of us don't want to. Yeah. And yes, um, Trollbox, um, wallet raid to your heart's content if you can find any, because um, it'll work. They still haven't patched it. So what's the lesson, boys and girls? When you put together um, custom Bitcoin scripts, um, you should really be absolutely sure after meticulous thorough testing that that will work exactly how you think it works. Because if it doesn't, this happens. Fun times. Are we ready for the next one? Yes, on to the Fast and the Infurious. Yeah, so this entire um, post-mortem document on GitHub is the most mind-boggling shit show um, I've ever seen. And there's some little gems in here that don't even have anything to do with Ethereum that I learned for the first time. So Let's get into it. So pretty much, um, instead of the usual different implementations fell out of sync here, it was actually um, different versions of a single implementation, um, Geth, the, the one written in Go. Um, so in a previous release, um, there was a bug introduced um, that would allow a specially crafted transaction um, to be interpreted um, differently by different versions of Geth. And they quietly patched this in a subsequent release. But um, then some devs poking at things on chain um, triggered this and caused the consensus split. And see, there's so much cluster fuckery here in terms of dropping the ball. But the, one of the biggest ones is Infura's node was one of the old unupgraded versions that broke consensus. Um, so fuck up one. They didn't even reach out to important infrastructure operators to make them privately aware of this issue and to protect themselves from it. Give a good golf clap. All right. Sounds about right. Second fuck up. They did not make the patch um, backwards compatible. So um, generally when, when little goofs like this have happened in Bitcoin's history, um, the patch was um, kind of um, set up in a way so that new nodes would like not even relay um, transactions that were problematic or refuse to put them in a block. And the entire upgrade was structured and deployed so that as soon as you hit a quick critical mass with relevant nodes in core propagation or mining and such, um, even unupgraded nodes are protected from the issue because none of those operators, um, you know, are, are going to, they're acting like a filter or a shield for everybody else who hasn't upgraded. Third fuck up is, um, and th this is um, from Greg Maxwell again, I'm um, kind of going through how previous issues like this were resolved in Bitcoin in the replies. Um, but what was done um, when you can't really point out the issue yet is the upgrade or patch is buried in a release and then a release after that. Um, uh, th just find some other issue to solve unrelated to the the one you quietly patched and then point at that 
as a big problem that everybody needs to upgrade for. And then people upgrade and they're protected from the issue, the, the real issue that was not disclosed yet that was quietly patched in the previous release. Um, so pretty much the, the entire handling of all of this was just a clusterfuck shit show of not thinking through there's a lot of important infrastructure running on this maybe we should go around and make sure that infrastructure is safe um you know as part of the whole deployment process um because they just did this they introduced the fuck up they introduced the fix and literally didn't tell anybody didn't reach out to any important infrastructure operators any of this shit and then triggered the split by poking at things on chain themselves. And all you had to do is call your three friends who were actually running nodes. <laughs> yep. And now a hilarious thing, um, little gem, nothing to do with Ethereum, um, I found in, in the replies to this postmortem um, is uh, Deara from Zcash. Um, mm -hmm. In their response, describes how every Zcash release um, has an expiry time. Um, apparently, every 16 weeks after the release, um, by block height, the node expires and just turns off. And it stops running past that block height um, so that you have to upgrade to a new release to keep up with the network. So they have a, uh, they literally have a kill switch in that fucking um, client where every release um, just suicides itself and you have to go download the next one to participate in the network. It's literally not possible without deviating from the, the consensus and, and the, the code structure of that and, and tinkering with source code yourself to continue running old clients. That is like, like none of these clowns know what they're doing or understand the totality of of what they're fucking with and how cautious they should be and how much forethought should go into protecting important nodes or infrastructure in this system they're just fucking banging a damn hammer around and just not caring at all that there's actual value and businesses and services built out on top of this and it's it's just like they are clowns they are literally clowns well i mean i don't know who's actually using zcash and uh the only people using ether in any serious way are the what like the 1000 uh developers that all work for joseph lubin <laughs> It's just, it's just like, oh my god. It's kids playing adults at the kids' table. Well, yeah, uh, epic week in terms of shitcoin shit shows. Epic week. Um, top Kex, I give it a 10 out of 10. Is our show title going to be Fast in the Inferiors? Because I can't give that up now. Well, yeah. Yep, it is going to be now. Yay. Now that that is settled, though, um, so out, outside of the Bitcoin or crypto space, um, been a very interesting development with a big computer manufacturer. Yeah, so it's not directly related to Bitcoin, but it is relevant in terms of uh, privacy and anyone who may be using bitcoin stuff uh or trolling bitcoin twitter from a mac uh because there has been a post that's got people's attention over the last few days titled your computer isn't yours published on november 12th by jeffrey paul who is a berlin-based security researcher and he writes it's here it happened did you notice i'm speaking of course of the world that richard stallman predicted in 1997 the one Cory Doctor also warned us about. On modern versions of Mac OS, you simply can't power on your computer, launch a text editor or ebook reader, and read or write, and actually I got that <laughs> backwards, and write or read, without a log of your activity being transmitted and stored. It turns out that in the current version of the Mac OS, the OS sends to Apple a hash, unique identifier of each and every program you run, when you run it. 
Lots of people didn't realize this because it's silent and invisible and it fails instantly and gracefully when you're offline. But today the server got really slow and it didn't hit the fail fast code path and everyone's apps failed to open if they were connected to the internet. Because it does this using the internet, the server sees your IP, of course, and knows what time the request came in. An IP address allows for course, city level, and ISP level geolocation and allows for a table that has the following headings. Date, time, computer, ISP, city, state, application hash. Apple or anyone else can, of course, calculate these hashes for common programs. Everything in the App Store, the Creative Cloud, Tor Browser, cracking or reverse engineering tools, whatever. This means that Apple knows when you're at home, when you're at work, what apps you open there, and how often. They know when you open Premiere over at a friend's house on their Wi-Fi, and they know when you open Tor Browser in a hotel on a trip to another city. Now, that's only the intro to the post. There's a lot more, but basically he goes into detail about uh, what exactly is uh, happening here. And, uh, well, I think this intro should have enough to pick the interest of any Mac users we may have listening to the show. You should go and read the rest of it and maybe reconsider your life choices. And I say life choices because Mac users tend to use Macs and only Macs. And I think it's time that... uh, you join us penguins in the frigid application desolation known as Linux, because we may be cold, but we are free. Yeah. This is so many kinds of fucked up in terms of like, wow, just a total violation of people's trust and private or privacy completely in the background. But, um, why does it need to do this real time every time something starts? You can't download a signed hash when you install a program. You can't update that when you update the program so that all of these help the normie security checks happen without a crazy mind-blowing fractal privacy leak of everything. Like th- th- there was no private way to provide those kinds of security guarantees? Yeah, I don't I think I didn't look too much into this and I haven't looked into whether anyone from Apple has responded and explained why they do this. Um but in the main thread that got a lot of attention sharing this post, it was just it sounds like it was just something they put into the system maybe for I don't know finding bugs or just getting you know basic usage data of like i don't know what what the what do you even call apple users is there like a cute little nickname for for apple people um there is but i can't say it because when this goes on youtube that's a big strike no no okay we'll say it now and cut it out (laughs) when you edit Oh, okay. <laughs> All right then. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I I am assuming that their excuse is probably going to just be, oh, it's just you know we're just collecting it for analysis purposes. To you know, they always have when you get a you know application or service or whatever, they say, oh, they collect you know data that's relevant to approving their service i'm sure that's their excuse um but yeah it, the reason it's shocked people is like what i thought i thought apple was all about privacy and it's like yeah this is what happens when the when you use the word privacy and it only goes as far as your marketing department and it's not actually a serious you know you're not actually uh putting the the what, what's what's the phrase? You're not putting the metal to the grindstone. I don't know something along <laughs> something along those lines. They're they're not. You know, there's a lot of marketing, and they're not actually that privacy friendly. And to be honest, like the few times that I've used a Mac, like people talk about how user friendly Macs are, and I'm just like, I was just just using the like the file manager, and I wanted to go like I was I was in. I was in a deep folder and I wanted to go back to a previous folder and I like couldn't figure out how to do that because you know in Linux you just kind of like you know click done and Mac I have no it took me like five minutes to I had to actually look up how to go back in a folder so I don't know what you're talking about about user friendly and 
So yeah, Linux, do it. Time to move. See. And yeah, I, I, I will give iOS devices like iPhones and iPads are stupid, easy to use, but Mac OS on a laptop or a desktop is a nightmare. Why does that exist? Light it on fire. But yeah, uh, we need secure devices or this planet is going to get very weird. All right, is it time to roast another company for their poor security practices? Yes, do it. Do it. So, on November 9th, the Federal Trade Commission, or FTC, announced that they had reached a settlement with Zoom, because to the surprise of absolutely no one, they have been lying <laughs> about their use of encryption and other things. Uh, for anyone who wants to know the background on why no one should be surprised about this, we talked about it, uh, about Zoom in episodes 214, 19, 222, 224, and 225. So in the announcement, it says the Federal Trade Commission today announced a settlement with Zoom Video Communications, Inc. that will require the company to implement a robust information security program to settle allegations that the video conferencing provider engaged in a series of deceptive and unfair practices that undermined the security of its users. Before I continue, I first want to point out this is a U.S. government agency telling a company that they need to do better at the crypto. <laughs> Can I just point out how amazing that is? <laughs> given the current climate. Anyway, Zoom has agreed to a requirement to establish and implement a comprehensive security program, a prohibition on privacy and security misrepresentations, and other detailed and specific relief to protect its user base, which skyrocketed from Italian in December 2019 to 300 million in April 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic. Wow, that's basically the entire population of the United States. Um... In its complaint, the FTC alleged that since at least 2016, Zoom misled users by touting that it offered end-to-end -end 256 encryption to secure users' communication, when in fact it provided a lower level of security. End-to-end -end encryption is a method of securing communication so that only the sender and recipients and no other person, not even the platform provider, can read the content. That is an accurate definition. <laughs> In reality, the FTC alleges Zoom maintained the cryptographic keys that would allow Zoom to access content of its customers' meetings and secured its Zoom meetings in part with a lower level of encryption than promised. Again, absolutely no one is surprised by this because a lot of people have been saying this. Um, anyway... Zoom's misleading claims gave users a false sense of security, according to the FTC's complaint, especially for those who use the company's platform to discuss sensitive topics such as health and financial information and dick pics. Um, <laughs> in numerous blog Gotta posts, Zoom... dick pics. Yeah, or you might get, uh, you might get fired. Uh, Zoom specifically touted its level of encrypt... Well, actually, technically, no amount of encryption could protect you from that guys just be aware uh, zoom specifically touted its level of encryption as a reason for customers and potential customers to use zoom's video conferencing services uh one second while i scroll according to the ftc's complaint zoom also misled some users who wanted to store recorded meetings on the company's cloud storage by falsely claiming that those meetings were encrypted immediately after the meeting ended Instead, some recordings allegedly were stored unencrypted for up to 60 days on Zoom servers before being transferred to its secure cloud storage. The cloud. The FTC also alleged that the company compromised the security of some users when it secretly installed software called a Zoom Opener web server as part of a manual update for its Mac desktop application in July 2018. The Zoom Opener web server allowed Zoom to automatically launch and join a user to a meeting by bypassing the Apple Safari browser safeguard that protected users from a common type of malware. With... <laughs> Well, this is basically malware. Um, without the Zoom opener web server, the Safari browser would have provided users with a warning box prior to launching the Zoom app that asked users if they wanted to launch the app. The complaint also alleges that Zoom's release notes for the July 2018 update were deceptive because they did not adequately disclose that the app update would install the Zoom opener web server on users' computers, that it would circumvent the Safari browser safeguard, or that it would remain on users' computers even after users deleted the Zoom app. Yes. No one is surprised by any of this. 
idiots are. But they're surprised by everything. But yeah, it, it is extremely weird to see this come out of the FTC while the DOJ wants to smash encryption with a hammer. Yeah. Come on, be better so we can ban you. Mm-hmm. Actually, wow, that's an amazing 4D chess strategy. Goad them into strong encryption and then ban that and then ban them. Whoosh, whoosh, wah. But so, I, I mean, totally it, when, you know, if anything does happen um, in any practical, practical sense with the DOJ's attempts to ban encryption, we should literally use this to get back at them and say, look, you you had a company that was claiming to offer privacy and security, and they were doing this weird thing where they were not offering end-to-end -end encryption. They had a key that they were able to access these meetings that people thought were private. That was misleading. It gave a false sense of security. Like, this should be thrown back in their fucking face. And they'll probably be like, okay, um, company directors and government people can get it, but none of you plebs. Well, remember, that was what was originally going to happen is uh, when Zoom said that they were going to add encryption, they were like, oh, only for the verified people, not the rest of you plebs. Top logic. Alrighty, time to refresh a window. Yes, what, uh, what has the uh, Bcash, what, I don't even, what, who are Bcash? Don't even know what they're doing anymore. They're almost non-existent. Yeah, I separated this one from the other shitcoin fuck-ups because it's not really top tech. Um, but yeah, today was the day um, that Bitcoin ABC added their developer tax and Bcash split in two. And as of four hours ago, um, the version of the client that did not have the developer tax um, had a six block lead and the developer tax fork um, has not found a single block yet. So um, yeah, I think this was a resounding no thank you to Amory and his um, consensus change to create a development uh, fund pot for himself directly out of the Coinbase. So I would just like to say to all the little dragons den minions out there, you guys failed. You were supposed to troll idiots in our BTC into supporting this so that it's split in half again. You failed. You're all fucking fired. No severance pay. But uh, yeah, I guess that, uh, that wraps the stories up for today. What do we got? What do we got for final thoughts? What do we got? Well, there is a uh, particularly good tweet that I think I saw in the last day or two by a guy, uh, his handle is Eeyore on Twitter, Oliver, and he says, uh, you're, if you're collecting personal data, how should I protect this is actually your third question. Should I collect this is the second question. The first question is, uh, what would the worst people do if they got hold of this, which I thought was pretty good say that is a solid way to think about that also uh well by the time this episode airs it will have already started but tomorrow is the start of the cij logan uh, symposium which is going to have a bunch of interesting people speaking and it's free to attend you just have to create a account on the platform called hop in and uh, a bunch of interesting people are going to be speaking, especially about Julian Assange and the case. So I recommend it, especially if you're a journalist or looking to be a journalist. Bang, bang. Well, I'm kind of dry on thoughts today, so I will just uh, toss out, hey, everybody's still up in arms about the election result instead of just waiting to see what happens. None of you have ever presidential race that wasn't rigged wake up is it still february 15th all right adios punks <laughs> that's getting edited out see you later bye